Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another FinTech Nexus webinar. My name is Peter Renton, Chairman and Co-Founder of FinTech Nexus, and today we are focused on the Caribbean, or the Caribbean, whichever way you want to say it. You know, Latin America has a lot of uh, potential that has been very well documented uh, through over the last few years, and uh, that the Caribbean, I think, is poised to have the potentially even more potential. So with that, we have a group of experts here who are going to talk about Caribbean fintech, the state of entrepreneurship, fintech entrepreneurship, access and opportunity in the Caribbean. There is a lot of opportunity here, and we will get into that in some depth in this session. So with that, we're going to start with some intros right off the bat. So um, why don't, we're just going to go down my screen here. Um, Andrew, why don't you give us a quick intro? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I'm Andrew Morris. Um, I'm the chief content officer for Fintech Islands. And Fintech Islands is co-hosting this webinar with Fintech Nexus. It's the largest Fintech conference in the Caribbean. And we'll talk more about that that later, but it, it's great to be here and very thankful this Thanksgiving week in the U.S. to uh, to have these three panelists join me who are all speaking at the conference in January. Okay, Kevin. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm Kevin Simmons. I'm a partner at Lofty Inc. Capital. We are a pan-African venture capital firm. So we invest in early stage technology. We also have a mandate, a roommate looking at the Caribbean um, and in our capacity in our, our fund, a group of funds, we are heavily FinTech, maybe, well, our strongest vertical is FinTech. And in the African market, you know, we've been investing for maybe 10 years, uh, about 160 companies. And as I said, about a third of those are FinTech and we see a lot of exciting opportunities both there and in the Caribbean. Thanks very much, Peter. Okay. Eldred? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eldred Garcia. I'm the Senior Vice President of Business and Partnership Development at First Atlantic Commerce. First Atlantic Commerce is, um, many would say, the, the gateway of the, the Caribbean. We're connected in 29 countries, just about every single financial institution and processor. And we process about uh, uh, roughly about 90% of all the e-commerce volume uh, that's going in and out of the Caribbean. Okay, and last but not least, Nicholas. You're on mute, Nick. Uh, my apologies. Uh, my name is Nicholas Reese. I am the chairman and co-founder of a company called Canoe. We're domiciled out of Nassau, Bahamas, well, in Grand Bahama. And we're a licensed financial um, payment institute, um, licensed by the Central Bank. And we're also leaders in sand dollar infrastructure which is the world's first central bank digital currency so happy to be here okay we'll be talking more about that um okay the way this is going to work is i'm going to hand off to andrew who's got a, a brief presentation uh to go through and then uh, he's going to hand back to me and we'll we'll get into the q a with the panelists so over to you andrew excellent so thank thank you peter so so as I mentioned, I'm, I'm the chief content officer for a conference called FinTech Islands, and it'll run January the 24th through the 26th in Barbados. Um, and all of the other panelists will be speaking at the conference. Our mission at FinTech Islands is to be a catalyst for uh, the growth of FinTech in the region. And it's a global conference uh, that's held there every year. And so we did, in partnership with FinTech Nexus, a, a brief survey. We wanted to get a feeling from the, the FinTech community, their views on this whole topic of how do you unlock the Caribbean's potential. So what I'm going to share is a, just a little bit about that short survey that ran over the last uh, few weeks, and then we can use that as a framework for the discussion today. So I'm going to share my screen to do that. There we go. All right. So, yeah, let me just go to the first slide. So to give you an idea of who completed this survey. So it was a, again, it was a sort of a brief informal survey 
Uh, we had a, a meaningful response, but it's a, it was a small number because it only ran a short time. Um, so not statistically significant, perhaps, but interesting directionally. Um, about a third of the uh, respondents were of Caribbean descent. Uh, the rest were global, which in this case probably means Latin America and the U.S. Um, very uh, highly educated group who went all college, you know, for the most part, 80% college university in the Caribbean, Europe, or in the U.S. or Canada. Um, the respondents were more than half from fintech startups. So this was an entrepreneurial group of people that responded, financial institutions representing the second biggest category. And of those fintech startups, most of them were the founder or a co-founder of the organization. And then from, from the larger companies, we had mid-level executives, C-level executives, et cetera. So, so this is the perceptions of a group of entrepreneurial fintech leaders, uh, many of them from fintech startups, uh, and a nice mix of global and the Caribbean region. So the first thing we asked is, what do you feel is the greatest hindrance to fintech adoption in the Caribbean? So this is what you know, consumers and small businesses adopting financial technology. What's what might be holding that back? Uh, the number one answer, as you can see here, was this is the perception of our survey respondents, lack of education and understanding about fintech solutions. And number, uh, number two uh, was lack of trust for government and financial regulators, which I thought was sort of an interesting uh, response. And some other reasons about cost and availability, but it's mostly either lack of education or lack of trust that, that our survey felt was holding uh, people back. Then we said, well, what's, what's holding back entrepreneurship in the region? What's the hindrance there? And number one, by a long shot, not surprisingly, given that it was fintech founders, <laughs> lack of access to investors and funding. So one of our panelists, Kevin, is an investor, so he can speak to that. And the second is small heterogeneous markets that make it difficult to scale your business. The Caribbean's quite large. There's 45 million people across the region. It's close to the population of a country say like Spain, but it's of course comprised of many different smaller countries and with different central banks, different regulatory environments, uh, three different languages, et cetera. So either lack of access to funding or these small markets were the top reasons for uh, hindrances to entrepreneurship. Next, we asked, what is the greatest asset that the Caribbean brings to the table? And this wasn't as clear cut. There were a lot of different answers here. Number one was pent up demand for digital transformation. Um, number two, the attractiveness of the region to global tourists and wealthy investors that may be what people who were kind of less educated about the region might say, but it's also truly an asset. Uh, number three is regulatory sandboxes that allow for FinTech experimentation. Um, so kind of regulatory friendly environments to start a business. So then we asked what focus areas, what aspect of FinTech has the greatest opportunity in the Caribbean? Um, our number one answer was open banking or open finance. So data sharing and FinTechs partnering with banks through APIs and that whole opportunity. Number two was cross-border payments. And then you can see mobile uh, payments, banking. Um, interestingly, digital assets was pretty far down the list. Uh, that was a little surprising. Um, and then the last question was just, what is a future outlook? Um, in the year 2030, will the Caribbean be a more significant player in FinTech than it is today? So our respondents who represented both global respondents and those of Caribbean descent, three-fourths of them said yes, that the Caribbean is going to be a bigger player um, in just you know six or seven years. And so that's um, what we found from the survey and really looking forward to hearing 
our panel of experts talk about some of these same topics and um, and uh, that that's what we learned from our survey. And this this report will be available uh, and published on Fintech Nexus's website. And so the, uh, you'll be able to uh, to go there and, and download it. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. You can stop sharing your screen. There we go. And now we're going to get into sort of the, the meat of the discussion here. And I want to, um, before we go and dive into some of the things that were mentioned in the survey, let's kind of get a little bit more uh, information from our panelists about what they do. So, um, you know, Kevin, you talked, your, your focus is on, or the biggest, the biggest segment of your investing is on, is on FinTech. I mean, you talked about Africa. Um, what, what, a, what sort of particular parts of the, you know, geographically and within, within the niches of FinTech, what are the, what are your, what are you, what are you focused on? Uh, great question, Peter. Um, thank you. So, so first, geographically as a firm, we're extremely pan-African. Uh, we looked at deals over the last two, three years in 34 different African markets. There, there are 54 markets. Africa has a lot of similarity to the Caribbean because it's not just one homogenous, um, you know, there are a lot of different regulatory bodies and countries. Um, but we invested in 13 markets. Um, what, what we're looking for, we really look for at the moment for, for three things. We look at a lens first of uh, solutions that connect people to existing financial systems. So what you might hear as, you know, banking the underbank, there are a number of people that are not really a part of formal financial systems. So we look for solutions that connect them to that. Um, we look for solutions that we say develop people along. There's, a, there's an arc or a pathway of, you know, you start with a, a typical you know, a bank account for many of us, and then you get into, you know, savings products, loans, insurance, and, uh, you know, up to personal financial management. So there are a number, we believe that technology can be very useful for helping people develop along that, that curve. And then the last thing that we really look for are things that can be used largely by enterprises and merchants. Uh, so obviously Africa is heavily trader oriented. So um, that's why we focus on small businesses and merchants that can help them do their business a lot better from a financial perspective. So what kinds of tools and solutions do large enterprises and merchants look for? So those are kind of the three buckets that we, within we within which we look for our investments. I could be more specific if you wish, but I think that covers it generally. Yeah, no, that, that, that was that was very helpful. Okay, so Eldred, I want to turn to you. You talked about, I think you said 90% of all e-commerce payments in the, in the Caribbean, which is astounding, but maybe, if, you could sort of take a step back if you could and, and, and talk about the payments landscape. Uh, what, what's it like and how are you, what, how are you, is your company solving the pain points there? You're on mute. Eldrin. Yep. I, I just had a, you would think that after COVID we would know where the mute button is. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. And yeah, so looking at the, the landscape in the Caribbean, uh, it's, Basically, it's a it's a blend of traditional banking systems, modern fintech advance and advancement. So you have, you know, cash is dominant. Obviously, uh, I would say probably depending on the market and you know, like Kevin, you said, there's you're talking about you know, <laughs> depending on who you ask in the Caribbean, they'll tell you how many Caribbean islands there are. <laughs> so there there's a lot of them, and um, depending on the market you would say anywhere between 60, 70, 75% are still paying in cash. Um, and that's for, for a number of different reasons. However, you know, uh, credit cards is, is becoming uh, more and more uh, popular. Um, you, you're, you're starting to see uh, mobile uh, uh, money or wallets, if you will. Um, obviously, remittances is is it's big um, because people are, you know, they're, they're leaving and they're uh, sending money back and forth. Um, so that's, that's also, uh, you know, part of the, of the landscape. Um, but there is um, FinTech innovation is, is definitely occurring. So I've been on the road now for about a month um, doing uh, road shows and talking about um, two things, data security, and emerging technologies. And data security uh, has been top of mind for, for a number of different reasons. And, and I'm sure that if you guys follow the news and, and data breaches and whatnot, you've seen 
some of the some of the interesting headlines. But um, part of my conversation is obviously, you know, we we need to a number one protect protect the house before we keep adding new technologies to make sure that we don't make a, a bad scenario worse. Number one, number two, um, these these technology gaps that we are experiencing in the Caribbean. Um, like Kevin, you mentioned, you know, um, you know, technology is going to uh, bridge those gaps, right? So one of the things that we're seeing is that um, the challenges, the barriers uh, to get that technology, whether it's cost, definitely a, a situation, or the fragmentation of the of the financial system. So when you're talking about card present um, and card not present, two different completely different environments, card not present creates a whole uh, interesting slew of, of challenges because of certifications and whatnot, and they're by country, by processor, by bank, so it becomes very complicated. But when you look at e-commerce, it facilitates that that um, that that process. So what we're seeing is fintechs are stepping in and figuring out how to um, put in payment solutions that leverage existing rails in the card not present space to fill in those gaps. And part of the presentations that I've been giving is highlighting those kind of technologies. And we can get that uh, into that uh, further in the discussion, but we definitely have the technology. We have the appetite. We've seen an increased um, amount of attention in the Caribbean um, for a number of different reasons, but um, the technology is there and the opportunity is there. So the, you know, the, the outlook is definitely positive. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Nicholas, I want to turn to you and talk about your, you know, Canoes Digital Wallet. Maybe you can describe what it is and how, you, what, what pain points you're solving. And just to, is it, are you only in the Bahamas at this point or where, whereabouts are you focused? So at present, um, present day, we are operational in the Bahamas. And we have uh, we have boots on the ground in four additional um, Caribbean um, territories, and um, but primarily I'll, I'll talk about you know what we're what we're expanding and, and what we're doing in the Bahamas. Um, if I were to say the biggest pain point that that we're solving today in a real way um, would be in the delivery of food assistance to persons in need, um, persons on social aid. Um, coming out of the pandemic during the and and even afterwards, um, we have eliminated the lines um, that are required for persons to stand on. We've eliminated the personal vouchers. Um, we are essentially delivering, you know, to thousands of individuals at the push of a button, um, digital food aid, which we found empowered them to now go directly into the store without standing in any lines and also having the their dignity. Um, I guess degraded by having to pull out a physical voucher in the line at, at a food store. So we've we've taken that experience and made it an, an uplifting experience, and it's something that's been you know very valuable. And um, uh, we you know really proud of that. Um, the, it you know canoe in its entirety um, is much more than a a, a digital wallet. Um, our system and technology stack really centers around five key elements, um, one of which is a mobile application or what we're terming a super app. Um, that super app is essentially um, in, you know, evolving a model around social mobile commerce. And we have a multi-tender wallet that features central bank digital currencies, um, our own closed loop tokens, as well as credit cards, points, and our you know gift card solution, which we also give that same multi-level platform distribution to small businesses as well, which is a really um, unique feature. We have the POS app, which is a tool for businesses that helps the QR gen code generation. And then we have an audience relationship manager, which is essentially a CRM for our businesses that comes along with, and this closes off the ecosystem. This enables businesses to stay engaged with users, enables, enables them to connect, drive sales, and actually incentivize and um, their users um, when not in store um, in a remote digital capacity. We have the marketplace, which builds off of the um, CRM platform. 
And that marketplace enables businesses to put their products up. So whether that business has a website or not, we get their products up in 24 to 48 hours in what's called a single site connect zone that is web-based as well as in the M-commerce, in the mobile app store. So it, within our mobile app, uh, that user, that merchant would have its own shopping section and their products are housed there as well as on their website. And that also features or syncs into a consolidated marketplace. And we have the, we are also building customized marketplaces for some of our merchants as well. Our biggest and brightest uh, tech technology development has really come about from being lucky enough to be in the Bahamas when we launched the sand dollar. So as you would know, the sand dollar was the world's first central bank digital currency. We actively embraced the development uh, around that. We became the world's first interoperable uh, mobile wallet um, for CBDCs um, and even bringing CBDC payments to a web-based uh, framework. And we launched the world's first government payment CBDC um, platform. Um, and so that is in existence today. And that facilitates all revenue, all expenditure for all government departments, mapping back to uh, your treasury, um, your treasury management features. And it's essentially the beginnings of enabling real-time budget-based reporting for governments. That product, we've now taken that product in partnership with SAP, and we are enhancing that product for delivery to the global marketplace. Um, so okay. a bit of us in a nutshell. All right. Well, thank you for that. That was that was really interesting. So let's um let's now dig into the, the meat of the survey. I want to have sort of an open discussion here. There's five core topics that the, the, the survey covered. And the first one was what are the greatest hindrances to fintech adoption in the Caribbean? And you know, the survey was talked. Andrew talked about the lack of education, understanding about fintech solutions, lack of trust for government and financial regulators. But I'd like to get um, our panelists involved here, and and what you know, as, as as people who obviously are in the market, what do you think is the greatest hindrances to fintech adoption? Anyone can uh, can start us off. If, if if you want, I I can I can jump in and I, I, I can throw a couple of things into the mix and we can we can talk about them. So, number one, you know the old adage of keeping doing the same thing in the same way and expecting a different outcome, right? So trying to change the mindset of individuals and 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 move away from traditional uh, ways of of making payments, um, it, it change is always scary. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, um, when you Adopting new technology, you're and you're dealing with legacy systems. Um, um, there, there's always a, a challenge. There's cost associated with that, and then trying to figure out how to connect old legacy uh, technologies to, to to new technology. One of the things that we we've done at at FAC, we've been around now. We just celebrated our 25th year, and we've had a a, a very robust uh, payment gateway specifically focused for the e-commerce space, but we, we realized a few years ago that uh, we needed to go to the next level. There is new technology. Technology is is growing, changing at a very rapid pace. Um, new APIs way and SDKs and new ways to connect new technologies that don't require the, um, a resource intensive investment. Um, but in order to do that, you have to have the platforms, the technology in order to support that. So what we did is we built a brand new platform, a new brand new technology platform with all the new technology bells and whistles, if you will. And it is an omni-channel platform, which covers um, all the different payment channels that exist out there. So card present and card not present. And this has facilitated those conversations about how do we bring new, new technologies, easy ways to plug in and turn things on, um, exploring new technologies that... Um, break old behaviors. So I'll give you one for instance, terminals, physical terminals. That's old technology, essentially. We're dragging it into to the future and we're trying to figure out how do we leverage old technology, technology for tomorrow. Um, we don't need to necessarily do that anymore. So we were talking about using applications, leveraging existing 
mobile phones. Um, using you know, in the background, you have a, a QR. Uh, before they used to be static, now they're dynamic. Um, there's a lot of new technologies that we can uh, implement, but we need to also help change the mindset of letting go of the past in order to start moving towards the future. Anyone else wants to jump in? I mean, I, yeah. I, go ahead, go ahead sure. Nicholas. No, well, no, yeah, I'm just jumping with you because I, I may have to tell. Um, sure. Yeah, so, so we, we kind of look at the hurdles very much like like Eldred said. Um, so I split my time between uh, Africa, so I'm, I'm presently in Kenya, and, and Barbados. And we see much of the same thing. So there's a, the human component, which does hinder adoption. Um, a really strong reliance and trust in existing legacy systems. So it's almost a rewiring of the consumer. And of course, that's easier at, at younger levels, but you know, folks that are more digitally native and a lot harder where there's the money and the habits to be broken, et cetera. Um, but we also then see from the FinTech side, I think one of the biggest pains that we see is that technology deficit that, that I think Elder was talking about, the, you know, um, connecting different systems, interoperability, um, you know, the banks that we deal with now in the Caribbean aren't yet fully up to where some of the FinTech founders want them to be in terms of the ability to share data securely and to, to build value, et cetera. And uh, probably the only other hurdle that I would add, um, and, and again, we do see it in a market like Africa because it's so many different central banks, same thing in the Caribbean, there is a, a policy hurdle that kind of does slow, you know, I'm sure Nicholas might, might speak to that where it's great, he's in the Bahamas, but if you went to come and operate the same thing right now in, in Barbados, there's another license, another set of, um, you know, we still don't have a real easy way to move things, um, approvals across boundaries. So I think those three things, the human, the tech and the regulatory are the things that I think we all have to work on um, over the next no, 10, 15 years, really. So I, yeah, I would, thank you, Kevin. I, I would echo um, the sentiments of, of both Ke uh, Kevin and, and Eldred. Actually, when we did our research, I think about a year ago, we came back with almost the same identical, um, you know, top three challenges, which were around education, trust, um, you know, and, and the um, cost and availability, which speaks to the, you know, the human elements, um, I think, and, and as well as technical elements, you know, and persons resisting change, you know, just wanting to stay in the norm. Um, I, I think that's just a part of it. I think, you know, the pandemic actually helped to nudge some people along. Um, and so we now have some leaders, um, per se, that are kind of driving the charge. But the, the biggest, you know, the big, and, and as a FinTech on the ground, like, you know, it's the biggest challenge, I think, you know, it, it comes down to this, this, um, this bringing people in the know so that they are comfortable with the value that the technology brings to them. And that's, I think once people get to that place then they're, they're willing to give it a, they're willing to give it a try and they're willing to, to come along, but there is a hurdle. Um, and it's educational and trust in my, in my, would be the two biggest for us and from our perspective. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Well, um, if you have a question for our panelists, hit the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get to those towards the end of the hour here. But I want to now move on to the second bit, as the second part of this, and this is the hindrances to fintech entrepreneurship. And uh, uh, as Andrew stated, the biggest one was lack of access to investors and funding. Um, the second one was the small heterogeneous markets that make it difficult to scale. So maybe, maybe Kevin, you can you can address the first one because you're the you're the investor on the panel here, and that's the number one number one hindrance they say is lack of access to capital. What are your What are your thoughts? Well, well, sh surely the uh, there is not enough, um, say, risk capital or early stage capital, so whether that's angel or venture in the region. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but it's true. I speak to a lot of budding founders. We, we Our firm launched a, a hub in Barbados in, in April, February this year um, called, called the WeHub to help bring founders along. And there are more incubator type efforts ongoing now across the Caribbean, but largely still, I would say access to capital is gonna be a challenge. But I would also say 
um, I still think that founders are, are going to struggle from not having enough, uh, I would call role models, mentors in, in the space to do startups. I think anyone that's doing a startup now or a fintech startup in the Caribbean is, is a pioneer. They are definitely the first wave of folks that decided, you know, we're going to take a, tackle a problem with, with a tech solution. And so the ecosystem is still really young. Um, an entire ecosystem capital. Um, and, and those founders have to go through a journey of building a business, having it fail perhaps, maybe not, and, and developing other founders. And then the whole ecosystem grows. You see that in Latin America now, you see it in, in Africa, and I hope the Caribbean is not far behind. But, so I would say it's capital, but it's also founder development is still lagging. Anyone else have thoughts, the FinTech guys? Yeah, I'll, I'll throw in uh, a couple of thoughts here. Um, I work with a lot of uh, new FinTechs uh, with new technologies. And one of the things that we struggle is um, how do we get these things into, into markets um, in an environment that's, that's so fragmented? So one of the things that I've been working on with, with new, new partners and new FinTech partners is uh, creating a best of breed uh, partnership where we identify um, all these different moving partnerships that can contribute to making this successful. And I'll give you a, for instance, um, when we address issues like hardware and the cost of hardware and deploying hardware, um, we know that the traditional way of going after that, that tail end of merchants, which are the small micro merchants, um, we, we, and we can't, deliver our piece of hardware because of the cost and the logistics and whatnot, um, then we look at, at, at the fintech space. How do we convert those physical hardwares into applications, leveraging those applications and dropping them into phones that uh, these merchants already have in their pockets? So it, you, initially you think, oh, that's that's great. That's pretty easy. But now you're talking about who's going to go after these merchants, right? Because the resources that it takes to go after one of these small micro merchants it's almost as much as it is to go after a medium merchant. And then the return on investment's out there. So then we have to say, okay, if, if we can't go after them because it costs too much, how can, can we go after these uh, profitably? And so then we have to look at different models that have worked outside of the Caribbean successfully bring those models in. I'll give you, for instance, payment facilitators, Payfax. Payfax model works very well in the U.S. out in, uh, in in other regions, but it's not a model that works well in in this region. Um, banks have traditionally shied away from from Payfax, so now we have we have a scenario where we have to work with the banks, um, work with the networks, Visa, Master uh, Mastercard, American Express, um, in order to do the due diligence, make everybody feel comfortable, so we can implement a Payfax model, so we can go after the the micro merchants so we can implement the technology to be able to go after these. So it's not a one, one prong approach. It's really understanding all the different moving parts and put a strategy in together in order to be able to go after this and implement these kind of technologies. And so these are some of the, the challenges that we are experiencing that new fintech uh, players need to be aware of. It's not just that you have a great technology, is how do you get it out there, right? How do you make it successful? And how do you um, um, scale it into a market that's very fragmented? Okay, well, let's let's move on to the next question here. And this is about um, asset, like we've gone from hindrances to assets now. So what, um, when it comes to what makes the, you know, what is the Caribbean's greatest asset as a, a global hub for fintech? Um, you know, this this was the one question that kind of was uh, there was no real one answer, but so I'd love to love to hear from all three of you that what 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 you think the that makes the Caribbean a um, uh, what's what's its greatest asset? So I I'll probably jump first, uh, Peter. No, oh, sorry, next. So so I I think that uh, there are two assets that that are underappreciated. So one is that the Caribbean has a high turnover velocity of, of people coming through because of its prominence as a, as a tourism destination. And so um, generally, even regular people are not that far from having an interaction with ideas and thoughts or tech 
or solutions that, that come from other places. So it's very easy to cross pollinate and so forth, as opposed to some of the places that we invest in heavily or are familiar with across different parts of Africa, there isn't that. And so you have a harder time educating in some sense. In some ways, I think it's easier in the Caribbean to, to achieve that. I think that is an asset. Um, the second asset that we think, well, again, um, it's really that a lot of the markets, even though they're different, they're very similar. Um, I could, you know, I can go to any Caribbean island and access public transportation um, and informal public transportation and be pretty comfortable doing so. So there's a real similarity of like lived experience. And that helps, I think, a founder who's looking to scale a solution not have to, you know, he can be pretty sure that he, uh, he or she, sorry, is, is what he's building will kind of work in a Jamaica as, as easily as in a St. Kitts or an Antigua. There's still a fairly common lived experience and that is an asset. Again, where, where, we, where I am right now, I'm sitting in Kenya, um, it's, it's not the same across much of the African landscape. So I'm probably comparing um, a Caribbean setting to an African setting, but that's why I think those are assets here because that doesn't exist where I'm sitting presently. So those are two assets the Caribbean has. Mm -hmm. I would, I would, if, if you allow me to jump in, I think from our, our perspective, as we begin to, to move about the Caribbean um, to address and experiencing some of these uh, same challenges, I, I quite honestly um, believe that the greatest asset that we have in the Caribbean is in fact our people. Um, the spirit and the educational level and capabilities of the people in the Caribbean is tremendous. Um, the talent on the ground in the Caribbean that you you so-called find under the rock uh, is amazing. And you, you would be surprised. And so it is really through our ability to identify, collaborate with, and work together is where we're finding our strong points in terms of being able to scale throughout to address the geographical uh, limitation of small market segmentation um, to scale rapidly through through multiple markets. And that's really being done through the power of connecting with people first and, and driving a, a people first approach to, to what we do. But I'm, you know, I've been extremely impressed with the level of competency um, of individuals throughout all of the islands. Um, and, and I think that that is our biggest, that's our biggest asset in my opinion. And I believe we're just too divided and we've not worked together enough. Um, if we come with the right approach, the right technology, the right funding and backing, we can solve each other's problems. Um, where one is weak, the other is strong. And I think it's about building and bringing this vision is to the wider Caribbean is something that is, is core to our messaging as a company. And we want to play a role um, in, in bringing that, like you say, uh, Kevin, um, to kind of show others the way, right? Um, because, you know, where we may have been the first, you know, we don't want to be the last. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think Kamala Harris, said, she said, uh, her mother said it best. She said, make sure, even though you're the first, make sure you're not the last. So we must always make sure that we're making a pathway for others. Um, so I'll, you know, yeah. So our people, um, in my opinion, are our greatest asset. Okay, Eldred. Yeah, the the only thing else I could add to that, and I mentioned it before, you know, um, with regards to to legacy system, we we have an advantage that we don't have. We're not dragging behind um, legacy systems like um, more developed countries. So we have an opportunity to do a lot of leapfrogging technology um, and um, not have to um, deal with that kind of stuff. So one of the things that I've noticed when we bring new technology, um, the, the main hindrance, while it's education and make sure that everybody gets feel comfortable and, 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 and adopts this new behavior, this new technology, um, from a technology perspective, we don't have to deal with uh, these legacy systems that have been there for, for decades like, let's say, for instance, in, in the U.S., where it takes uh, a whole lot uh, more resources in order to either update old stuff um, or connect old stuff to new stuff. Uh, some of the, Sometimes in the Caribbean, that stuff that just doesn't exist, and we are able to capitalize on that and move 
much more quickly in, in the Caribbean. So um, while we have all these challenges, like you said, there are numerous opportunities. Uh, today I was in a presentation and, and I heard somebody say that, you know, that one of the things that <laughs> the U.S. exports a lot is, is tourists. And guess where they're going? Uh, to the Caribbean. So um, I'm I'm uh, happy to say that I, I think, uh, like like you were saying, Kevin, that cross pollination of 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 uh, technology, understanding and using of new technology, it's absolutely forefront uh, when people come to the Caribbean. They're 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 asking for it. They're demanding it. Uh, they're showing it. So people in the Caribbean are are much more aware of it than in other uh, regions. Right. Right. Okay. So um, we've had an audience question here. I know Kevin has to actually jump on a plane. He's at the airport in, I presume, is it Nairobi? But anyway, it's a um, question for you, Kevin. Thank you for sharing how, this is. This came from the audience. Thank you for sharing how fintech solutions are used to preserve people's dignity when receiving government assistance. It's clear that digital payments can enhance inclusion. Can you elaborate on some of the specific features or strategies this solution employs to ensure accessibility and inclusion for individuals who may have limited access to traditional banking services or digital technology? Yeah, so um, great question. Um, I think obviously in, in, in the market that we spend most of our time working in, financial inclusion is really the, you know, what we're trying to achieve. And there are a number of what I'll call success stories already. I mean, um, I'm not sure how, how familiar everyone is with, with M-Pesa, right? Um, M-Pesa is really the de facto way of doing I live in Nairobi now and, <laughs> you know, I couldn't get around without M-Pesa, which is essentially, you know, mobile money. Um, and it allows people who don't even have a, a, you know, a bank account, a formal bank account. So people that that's don't necessarily have, um, you know, what it takes to open a bank account still in the Caribbean is in my mind still insane. Um, just so many layers of everything. If you don't have a, a, a job or a job letter, or you don't have this, you don't have that, you're not going to get banked. What, a lot of fintech solutions offer is the opportunity for you to still participate in financial transactions and, and to some extent be banked but by having wallets in different platforms by being able to you know send money you can get savings interest on it you can you can in some cases um, get credit so that allows more people to be included in 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 in, in the financial system really i mean that, that's why financial inclusion is at the heart of fintech push in africa in latin america in the caribbean it is uh, largely because of that potential to circumvent in some ways the traditional i think eldred was talking about that some of the systems that are in place don't really encourage you know we've got institutions the banks that are you know they've been built around risk management as they should be but as a result they're not able to facilitate um everyone in, in the same way. And so that's where FinTech comes in. So you've got wallets, mobile money, you've got peer-to-peer -peer payment systems, you've got, um, you know, now people are getting to cross-border remittances, uh, any number of things that are either costly or prohibitive. And that's what we mean by financial inclusion. It allows others to participate uh, without the same hurdles or restrictions that exist today. I hope that was helpful. And I'm sorry that I do have to run um, soon. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, understood. Safe travels. Thank you for, for, for making the time here today. Okay, so I want to get back um, to the the survey here and the the, the opportunities as far as different um, different fintech focus areas. So what? And obviously, each of your companies, um, Nicholas and Eldred, have a particular focus. But I'd like you to kind of think beyond just your company. What aspect of fintech has the most potential for success and impact in the Caribbean? Do you want to take that first, Eldred, or you? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'll I'll, I'll I'll dive in. I'll throw something out, and we can we can chat about it. Um, so one of the restrictions that I've seen in in the past, and I think you know, uh, Kevin mentioned earlier, and, and you know, it's been floating around. So um, we we're all working um independently if you will so if you have solutions in, in one island um that doesn't work in another i mean i live in puerto rico and um you know ATH is you know the way we pay but ATH doesn't work outside of puerto rico um you go to another island and they have something similar but it doesn't work out of that island so one of the challenges that we we have is how do we 
start interoperability so we can leverage that that kind of stuff so and, and from a technology perspective um i see opportunities where we can have um technologies that are interoperable across the caribbean um, that's number one number two making sure that everybody's included we we mentioned this making sure everybody's included and part of that is making sure that we able to facilitate that inclusion because i, I i've talked to merchants and it's not that they don't want to take digital payments it's just that the process of taking digital payments um, is almost impossible. So they said, you know, we, we can facilitate, you know, me getting an account so I can do this. I'm more than happy because I'm losing sales. It's just that those barriers need to be be addressed. And um, number three, I think really important is all these remittances that are going back and forth. This is going on, but not just in the Caribbean. This is going around the world and being able to transfer funds in a very efficient, cost-effective uh, instant kind of way um, is really going to uh, make a, a, a change in the future. So it's not just about payments. Uh, traditionally, you know, business, consumer to business, it's really about business, uh, person to person, person to business, business to business, um, making that, uh, that, that payment process um, not restrictive to the island, but more open to the globe. And I mean the globe, it's not just the Caribbean is is where i think we are going nicholas so i 100 percent agree interoperable technologies uh remittances um you know just thinking outside of you know what what we're currently scoped today um i think one of one area of tremendous value for the caribbean is in the space of digital identity and asset ownership um i know you know, asset ownership and digital assets kind of ranked low in the survey. Um, but I think in contextualizing this in terms of having a, a, a true authentic, you know, digital representation of your land, or if you're an Olympic, you know, track and field athlete, like you say in Bolt, you know, how do you monetize your shoes that you won the gold medal or broke the world record and um and, and giving platforms and, and enabling um you know athletes, musicians, the average uh creative individual to take that product and to sell that product, but to authentify that that product is authentic and unique, and then also monetize the, these subsequent ongoing royalties from resale of that asset. Um, the technologies today are available to accomplish that, um, such that in the evolution of time, as we have regulations evolve, we then now can contextualize land ownership, um, splinter titles, root titles, um, all being representative in you know a bank of objects, um, so to speak. Um, and then the identity technology is really you know envisioned for us to be built around consent tech, whereby I am me. I am my identity. I am the I authorize a particular passageway or doorway, technology, technological doorway to open um, by integrating a biometric um, platform where I am me, I am my wallet, I am my value, I am my collateral. So my biometric liveness is my authentication for access into any particular door. And I think that is the level of thinking and um, around the opportunity of driving real value. And I think the Caribbean in 2030 is going to be leading the way. Um, I, you know, we have just a significant amount of talent. If we can really attract the funds to this region uh, to really boost the creativity and the innovation, I think the Caribbean will be well poised to lead in a global space. We've already launched the world's first central bank digital currency. And I think that um, that goes a long way for us all and something for us to hold on to. And I think we can bring a lot of additional world first and, and, and lead the charge together. Okay. Can you, can you just, just quickly, let's talk about the sand dollar. Um, what, what is the adoption level and how is it being used today? So the adoption level for sand dollar has been, uh, has been marginal and for all intents and purposes uh, lower than than what would be desired. 
Um, and that is due to a multitude of, of reasons. One being, um, you know, a delayed or a lack of uh, adequate education plan widely um, spread amongst uh, the population. It is new. So it is, it, there is an, an educational and a learning curve to um, persons understanding that. Um, we have resistance to lack of trust of central bank digital currencies, which is at the core of our uh, user resistance because persons will say, well, I don't want my money um, to be visible by the state or there's the boogeyman that says that they're going to tax my money and restrict me from paying um, funds. And so we try to meet our users where they're at and educate them and bring them up to speed, but also the means and methodologies which, which we develop is we develop our systems and technology to protect our users, but also to enable them to have access um, to the inclusion tools that, that they need. But the, the, you know, when you talk about adoption of a central bank digital currency, adoption is really fostered in <laughs> really three this three-pronged approach to adoption one you have to have the means to print the currency two the government which is your largest entity has got to turn on its government payment system and it's got to activate payroll um, for government services and three you've got to have merchant locations uh, where they're able to spend withdraw exchange fiat so for any country that really wants to take a serious approach at adopting central bank digital currencies, it must be holistic in that that country is not only minting and printing a currency, but is also taking a serious look and a serious approach to engaging its public service uh, community in funding payroll through that CBDC, which pushes the currency into, into circulation. And then persons begin to use it. And it's, it's actually free, more efficient, and uh, more cost effective to implement a CBDC. We believe CBDC will become the means and methods of retail payment of the future. Digital assets will become your mode of wealth, uh, holding your wealth. Um, and so this, this is uh, something that we're actively working on the ground um, now, and now beginning to speak with some other countries about bringing that government payment system um, and elements of the treasury management features, et cetera, to wrap around their CBDC um, platforms so that, you know, to foster adoption in other countries as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. So let's get to another audience question here. What are the banks in the region saying about fintechs? Well, I, I, I've been in uh, a couple of conferences back to back to back, and they all have uh, financial institutions, and they they all are looking to, um, to facilitators with regards to fintechs. So having a fintech is one thing, connecting them is another, right? So one of the things that they look for is um, that connectivity, if you will, in the region. Since it's so fragmented, you have so many different banks and processors. Um, if a fintech tries to come in and do work in Bahamas and then tries to do work in Barbados and then tries to do work in Jamaica, um, they're essentially having to try to connect in everywhere they go. Um, one of the things that have been you know, highly successful for us, we took an approach of um, having best of breed partnerships. Um, when we took that approach, it facilitated the connectivity because for the last 20 some odd years, um, uh, painstakingly, our CEO has gone into every single island and connected single-handedly with, with our team, um, processors and banks. Um, so literally one bank at a time. Um, it, this is maybe not a very attractive financial model for a global organization trying to do this because they can get a bigger return on investment. But when you look at a company like First Atlantic Commerce that just focuses on the Caribbean and we develop things for the Caribbean, it made total sense for us because then we said, we need to create the connectivity 
build it if they will build it and they will come kind of idea right so create the connectivity so now we can go out to strategic partners that deliver this this technology and say technology and say connect to us and then you have that connectivity across multiple markets so fintech uh, financial institutions are really looking for players um like first atlantic commerce to facilitate that connectivity and looking for us to say you know what kind of fintechs are out there to address these particular needs right so we want to get into social commerce the expansion of e-commerce right all this noise is happening in social media that is converting into commerce how do we connect all these people um, when you go into soft pause or tap on phone how do we connect that uh, that technology to address those hardware issues um, with, without asking that fintech to go and connect to every single island, to every single bank and every single processor. So they're really looking at, at us in, in a partnership is let's go find these fintechs that are out there to address our needs and be able to make sure that once they connect, they can do work in multiple uh, countries, islands at a, at a time. Okay, let's maybe get time for one last question here. Um, how are the governments of the various Caribbean islands prioritizing fintech innovation to help their people? That's an interesting one. So I, I, I uh, you know, I, I think it's it varies country to country. Um, it varies country to country. We see innovation hubs being set up in in different, uh, you know, different countries. Um, you know, I would say political challenges are one of the challenges of fintech entrepreneurs in in the Caribbean. Um, consistency of licensing regimes, I, I think that all falls under the governments. Um, you know, there there should be you know there should be some standardization of the licensing processes and certainly some recognition of. Uh, each other's uh, regimes um, to make expansion across borders easily. Um, you know, in the Bahamas, there's been very, a number of initiatives to to foster fintech adoption. Jamaica has launched a regulatory sandbox as well as um, you know in the Eastern Caribbean. There, you know, have they have launched. So in the Caribbean, we have three central bank digital currencies just within the Caribbean alone. Um, so I think that speaks for the motivation of governments um, holistically to move towards uh, fintech adoption. But, you know, quite often, you know, governments change, um, policies change. I, I think I'm, I'm a big believer in private sector driving um, innovation um, and governments setting the ground, the ground rules for engagement, eliminating and reducing the red tape and allowing the private um, private market to really drive it. I, I think um, that that has been one frustration for you know for us. However, you know we've been lucky in the Bahamas. Uh, the Bahamas has a, has adopted this, has led the way. Um, certainly in central bank digital currencies, as well as with our their bill, digital asset re um, and registered entities bill. So we have a different experience in the Bahamas versus elsewhere. And but it is certainly somewhere some an area we can improve. Right, right. Yeah, you really need like an EU style kind of common economic community or something where you can passport licenses. But anyway, that's we're out of time. I, before we close, I just want to bring back Andrew. If you could uh, come back on, Andrew, just tell us a little bit about the the event in January. Well, absolutely. So first of all, thank you to Peter and FinTech Texas for. Uh, hosting this webinar, thanks to to Nick and, and to Eldred and Kevin for being such great panelists. So I've been involved in FinTech for 25 plus years, involved in producing events for over a decade. Peter and I have both been in that business. And I have to say that working on FinTech Islands has been one of the most rewarding things that I've been a part of. Uh, Allison Hunt and Kirk Perso, the co-founders, uh, reached out to me last year to help with their, their vision of being a catalyst for FinTech in the Caribbean. We had a very successful event in year one and we're excited about our upcoming event, our second edition in January. 
So I would invite all of you that enjoyed this conversation and would want to be a part of this journey that, that we're on, um, undertaking around FinTech and the Caribbean to come to FinTech Islands um, January the 24th to the 26th in Barbados. And I will share a slide. There is a opportunity for a discounted registration. If you enter a uh, discount cone that I'll show on your screen, but it's a three day conference with 140 speakers from all over the world, content that covers all aspects of FinTech, shared cultural experiences that you will enjoy that will uh, give you a flavor of what the Caribbean brings to the table and um, truly a global community. So please join us in, in January and uh, uh, at FinTech Islands and we look forward to seeing you there. Right, there it is. I, uh, I'm looking forward to it immensely. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be my, my first time in Barbados, so I, I'm I'm very much excited about that, and excited about the the event itself. So, um, with that, Andrew, um, you know Nicholas, Eldred, and of course Kevin, who had to leave, but thank you all for your uh, for your insights here, and thank you, of course, to the audience for watching um, and for your questions. Have a great afternoon, everybody. See ya. Thank you.